What's up guys, Demon 1, 2, and 2, and it's List Day. Ah oh, yes, List Day. And today we're continuing our look at the best cards in every main set of the game. Today's set is Cosmo Blazer. Cosmo Blazer is uh, a bit unremarkable, but there's some interesting cards that bolster current meta decks at the time and interesting leg support. We're gonna make our best of it. Also, this isn't uh, me f screwing with the color settings. Uh, my friend Ian got a boat and he's like, you should come putz around in the South Shore of Long Island. And I was like, okay. And then I got sunburned. Let me, let me, I might be able to fix it. <laughs> we'll go with that. A little movie magic there. So you know what? Let's just get into this set because uh, my face hurts. Number 10 is Spellbook of the Master. Spellbook of the Master is a normal spell card that reads, if you control a spellcaster monster, you can reveal one other spellbook card in your hand to target one normal spellbook spell card in your graveyard, except Spellbook of the Master. And then this card's effect becomes the effect of the card in the grave. So when it resolves, it just resolves as the other card. Why that good? I don't know. Well, spell cards have an interesting problem where they're like, if you just ignore their effects, they're they're kind of like inherently neg ones because you play them, they immediately go to grave when they resolve. So unless it's something like Pot of Greed that just draws you a bunch, you're fine that you lose, you burn advantage pretty quick when all you have is spells and traps. So it's cards like this that help you mitigate that damage by hitting things like Spellbook of Power or Spellbook of Secrets, which allow you to do a thing, insert thing or whatever. Reusing your spell cards in the graveyard is a good ability. You can really see why Spellbooks became one of the most powerful decks in the history of the game. Judgment aside, every one of their cards is just like a consistency card. It's just get more cards. All because you gotta mitigate that whole I'm a spell card thing. Number nine is Lightning Jidori. Lightning Jidori is a rank four wind thunder monster with 1900 attack and 1600 defense. Made of two level four wind monsters, not generic. However, this is a time in Yu-Gi-Oh when good generic easy spot removal in the extra deck was still at a premium. And the rank four toolbox being probably frankly the most diverse and easily accessible meant that they gotta be careful with the rank four monsters they give us. So they landlocked the thing to wind decks, meaning that if you play a rank four wind deck, something like Harpies, you are rewarded with a slightly unique option for your extra deck. That's a a little bit better than whatever else is floating around. Just don't go blowing your in it. What makes Lightning Jidori really cool is the amount of advantage you can tease out of it. When it's XC summoned, you can target one set card your opponent controls and return that to the bottom of their deck. Woo! Also, you can detach one material from the card to target one face-up card they control and put that on the top of their deck. So this card can reliably remove like two cards from your opponent's side of the field three if your opponent manages to not get rid of it. That's a pretty good investment on the neg one you had to do to make the damn thing. This is a huge impactful play from the extra deck, especially at this time during the game. So it really was a boon to rank four win decks, giving them a fun, powerful extra deck option that is unique to themselves. Speaking of unique rank fours, uh, we got Ectorgus, King of the Noble Knights. Made of two level four Noble Knight monsters, this thing's not just stuck in an attribute type deck, it's stuck in an archetype. And because of that, it is tailor-made for that deck and is actually a pretty solid box monster for them Noble Knights. The way Noble Knights work is uh, they gain effects when they get their equip spells equipped to them. Uh, they're knights, they got equip spells that are swords. Uh, they do knights with sword stuff. Trouble is, uh, if you go to Xe or Synchro with a dude equipped with a bunch of crap, you lose all that crap. So, uh, what is the wayward knight errant supposed to do? Well, if you make Arturigus here, when he's summoned, you can target three equip spells that are in your graveyard with different names that are noble arms things. You can equip those guys to him. So uh, if you have a bunch of crap equipped to like boars or something and you overlay, you can stick these things to him instead. Nice. Nice. But uh, okay, so you made a big bad boss monster and he's got like your whole graveyard equipped to him. Uh, does he do anything else? <laughs> I mean, kinda. You can detach one material from this card to uh, destroy spells and traps on the field, up the number of noble arms equipped to this thing. That's actually really not too bad. It lets you blow up your opponent's back row. However, if you're getting a really good full use of this card, um, your opponent must not be playing very good back row because uh, <laughs> none of that stopped the summon of this card. So uh, what the hell is your opponent doing? It'd be nice if he had some protection or something though, you know, right? Other than whatever's bestowed to him by the, by the, the equip spells. All right, here we go. The next one's an actually good extra deck monster. Oh, got him. Crimson Blader. Crimson Bladder? Oh, that'd be, oh, that's like, that's like something seriously wrong though, right? I summon bladder stones in defense mode. <laughs> Level eight 
Fire Warrior Synchro Monster. Now the discerning Yu-Gi-Oh player might say, But Dave, this is an Xeor set. Why the hell are we talking about a Synchro Monster? Well, that should inform you the uh, caliber of the card in this in this set. It's uh, it's okay. <laughs> no, Crimson Blader is actually pretty good. 28, 26, pretty good attack defense spread made of one tuner and one or more non-tuners. It's a generic level eight synchro monster. And his effect says, if this monster destroys an opponent's monster by battle and sends it to the graveyard, what am I doing holding this for? Your opponent cannot normal or special summon monsters that are level five or higher on their next turn. Okay, so he's just a beat stick. He doesn't do a hell of a lot just sitting there. But if you can successfully make an attack with them, you are rewarded with your opponent not doing a hell of a lot on their next turn, assuming that their deck contains level five or higher. And again, you might say, well, what are they, a fusion or synchro deck? That's terrible. What the, what, what, what are people playing right now? Well, you got to remember, even though this is the height of the XC era, we, we do have like rank five and higher as well. So maybe this doesn't turn off the boss monsters in your extra deck you're trying to make, but it does stop you from trying to like, you know, make any material. So regardless of what your opponent's playing, this thing is a pretty solid extra deck option to turn off whatever they're trying to do. Especially if you're playing dragon rulers and uh, it's good in the mirror. It's kind of, it's fun watching that deck be slowly built over the, the course of this era, isn't it? Actually, it's kind of fun. Number six, Mermel Abyssius. Level seven water aqua monster, 1700 attack, but, but 2400 defense. Damn boy, he thick. You can discard one other water monster to special summon this thing from your hand. Oh cool, it's a, it's a, it's a, a level seven free body. I wonder what you're gonna do with that, right? So what is a free body? Let's look at an example. When summoned this way, you can add a level four or lower. Where When summoned this way, you can add one level four or lower merman monster from your deck to your hand. So it replaces the discard fodder. That's good card economy. You can only use this effect once per turn. Oh no. Mermail's a funny deck, if you really think about it. Uh, they're pretty much a, a reliable, viable deck since the time they came out till pretty much now. Being water gives them a ton of benefit because there's always generic water support coming out. They're just consistent and they OTK pretty easily and they can just kind of fall into Mullen Glacia. They can do that pretty much every turn, you know, two or whatever it is. It goes to show you, it doesn't matter how old and crappy your deck is, if it's just consistent, that's all you need. Consistency is better than power ceiling, baby. It really is. Bad respect for the Mermails, man. No, you guys just kind of, no, you don't quit. You're like invoked. Just never go away. Now time for a deck that I'm glad that went away. March of the Monarchs. March of the Monarchs is a continuous spell that reads, Tribute summon monsters you control cannot be targeted or destroyed by a card effects. You cannot summon from your extra deck. Oh no. Okay, so the discerning Yu-Gi-Oh player might be thinking, Who the hell is tribute summoning right now? This is absurd. It's bad! Yeah. And you know, you're right. Uh, tribute summoning is bad. Terrible card economy and it's slow. Unless your entire deck is based around the mechanic like the Monarchs are. Granted, this is a little bit before uh, their their time in the, in, the, in the sun because we haven't gotten their, uh, what do you call it? Their structure deck yet at this point. But this does start planting seeds for what is an obnoxious deck. And that whole not summoning from your extra deck thing sounds like a like a problem, but when you consider that the most viable version of the deck doesn't play an extra deck, it might as well just not say that. <laughs> All right, here we go. Number four, breakthrough skill. Breakthrough skill is a normal trap card that has the following effect. Target one, face of effect monster your opponent controls. That face of monster has its effects negated until the end of the turn. However, it does have a second effect that says, during your turn, you can banish this card from your graveyard to basically reuse its effect. Target a thing and negate its effects. Yo, that's good card economy, man. And because it's a trap card in your graveyard, it is still a spell speed too. So even though it is landlocked to your turn as a trap card, you know, feels a little clunky, remember that, you can chain it to crap. Mm. Not only is Breakthrough Skill a good monster in negation, it also kind of informs us where Yu-Gi-Oh is at this time. Long gone are the days of where you have impactful, huge spell cards and trap cards with just kind of mediocre monsters that just kind of sit on the bench. <laughs> Monster effect negation is going to be the most important type of stuff that we have on our spells and traps. Number three is Fire Formation Tanky. What I like about this entry is that Tanky feels like it's one of those cards that's always been in the game because it's just so synonymous with this type of deck. It's funny to think that there, that there was a time when we didn't have Tanky. The dark times. When this continuous spell is activated, you can add one level four or lower Beast Warrior monster from your deck to your hand. All Beast Warrior monsters you control gain 100 attack. Whoop-de-doo. And you can only activate one of these per turn. Okay, so. 
two things here. It's a Rota. That's amazing. It's a spell-based search card for monsters of an entire type. It's literally a Rota. But it is a continuous spell, which does carry the caveat that it must remain on the field in order to activate and resolve its effects. That is just what it means to be a continuous spell card. Which means that if your opponent pops it on activation, you don't get the search. Which, uh, pretty annoying that MST can negate my Rota. However, I do enjoy the fact that it exists simply because I like the idea that, that it opens up interaction between the two players. It's at least neat that you, it gives your opponent ways to try to stop your plays. It's good for, I don't know, the fun of the game. Yeah, it's not so great for the player who getting their card negated. Also, the, the attack was just fun. Now some of you might think this next one is cheating, Brotherhood of the Fire Fist, Tiger King. Insert clip from the show. You watch porn? Believe it or not, I've, I've actually never watched it. Um, should I? It says, yeah. Rank four, Fire Beast Warrior Monster, 22, 18 attack defense spread, made of two level four Beast Warrior Monsters. So again, it's, it's a landlocked sea monster. All right, you might be thinking, hey, it's cheesy to have tanky and then have a Fire Fist monster. However, they're, they're not the same archetype. They are related archetypes. Uh, one supports the other. And it's, it's my list, so I can do what I want anyway. <laughs> when this card is XC summoned, you can set one Fire Formation Spell or Trap card from your deck directly to the field. Oh, that's a good card advantage right there. Also, I think that effect is exactly why you consider uh, the Fire Formations an archetype, because this card officially supports them, because it calls them out by name. Once per turn, you can detach one material from this card, negate the effect of all other face-up monsters on the field that aren't Beast Warriors. <laughs> wow! Fire Fist coming out of the gate swinging with a great boss monster. Holy shit. Negating everything that's face up on the board, uh, that feels like a really, really good reactive play. It also has a third ability that says when this card is sent from the field to the graveyard, you can send three fire formation uh, spiller traps uh, you control to the graveyard that are just kind of hanging out to summon two level four or lower beast warrior monsters right from your deck in defense position. Okay, so it's a when you can, so I guess you can't really link it away or anything. It feels bad, man. But it is fun that it has an option to recur some of its advantage lost when you lose it, because uh, those fire formations, a lot of them don't really do anything while they're sitting on the board, so uh, so you might as well get rid of them to, to get some stuff back. And I also like how it's not landlocked to Fire Fist. Like, it just gets Beast Warriors, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of cool decks that can take advantage of this. All right, we do have an honorable mention. Bacon Saver. Bacon Saver. This little level two zombie says during either player's battle step, ooh, fun. You can banish it from the graveyard to negate an attack. That's, that's uh, occurring. <laughs> Weird card text. You can only use it once per duel. Uh, that seems a bit extreme. Can't negate too many attacks. Uh, is the card good? Not really. If you're playing like a weird zombie mill deck, uh, it's a fun tech to keep you from dying. It literally saves your bacon. Hardy har har. F***ing idiot. But it, it's not anything phenomenal. And we also have a dishonorable mention. Dice Nide. Dice Nide's a continuous trap card that reads, each time an opponent special summons a monster, you need to roll a six-sided die, and then return all of those monsters your opponent special summoned to their hand that have a level that matches the result of the die roll. Okay, so it's like, it's almost like a vanity's emptiness that's like one-sided, but totally up to random chance. That's terrible. I hate how this card is not good. It is a symptom of Yu-Gi-Oh. Uh, gamble cards just aren't good in this game. I don't know if it's because they just don't print them with the right effects, or if it's something to do with the fact that just every card in Yu-Gi-Oh is a resource, and we don't have, like, a mana pool or anything, so cards need to be impactful when they activate. So if a card doesn't do anything, it's just automatically bad in this game, because it needs to be impactful. Um, it's a damn shame, though, because it's a fun card. Anywho, today's sponsor is TCG Player. If you guys are still, for some reason, playing physical Yu-Gi-Oh, there's a no events, but you know, maybe you're doing the, the remote duel extravaganza or some hooey. You need some physical cardboard? Use my link in the description below. Hook yourself up. All right, the number one card in Cosmo Blazer. What could it possibly be? It's Diamond Direwolf. Diamond Direwolf, baby. Finally, a generic rank four. After all of these, 
non-generic rank four cards. What do? It blows self up. This generic rank four made of two level four monsters says, you can detach one material from this card to target one beast, beast warrior, or wing beast monster on the field, and then one other card and blow them both up. He's a beast. So you know what you're doing half the time? He's blowing himself up to pop another card. He's rank four scrap dragon. But Dave, that card advantage is terrible. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's real bad. But hey, if their opponent's got a floodgate, like an acro valley or some hooey, and it's just screwing you up and you can make one rank four play to save your skin, this might be what you need to out that card. At this time in the game, we just did not have access to cards that could just make a rank four play and just destroy anything. So we had to make do, blowing up our own diamond direwolf. Oh man, I don't miss that. Granted, the card's not bad. I, I shouldn't be so hard on it. It's pretty cool that it can blow up anything. And if you play it in a deck that's like wing beast or beast warrior or whatever, you don't actually have to blow himself up, uh, which might lend itself to blowing up something you might wanna kill on your side of the field to get some other effect off. So there is some weird combos you could do with it uh, if you're in a very specific deck, but that's taking away from the fact that it's generic and that was the entire point. So uh, more often than not, you are blowing himself up and uh, that's pretty frustrating. But for this time in Yu-Gi-Oh, this was very good. All right guys, that was Cosmo Blazer, the little set that uh, kind of just exists. Interesting cards, just kind of bolstering stuff that already, already is a thing. Um, let me know in the comments below what you guys think, and, uh, also, hmm, do you guys see these videos about a week after I record them? So, uh, this question is not going to be for the next video, but the, the video after, I suppose. But, uh, next, next video, I'm going to open this one up to all of you guys, not just the guys over on Discord to help with this list, because this one is going to be pretty subjective, and I think I want you guys to do some research. The next, next list is going to be the top 10 cards that, uh, made bad decisions in life. That's all you're getting. I'm curious to see what you guys do with it. And anyway, guys, remember, if you don't troll them out of who will, I'll see you guys next time. Just a quick special thank you to all my supporters over on Patreon. You guys make the whole channel possible. You guys have no idea how much it means to me that you guys do that. If you guys want to be part of the Goblet Attack Force, link for the Patreon down in the description below. Well, 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 look who's back. Be sure to subscribe to the channel this time or I will use my Millennium Rod and do devious, devious things to you. Evil things. Also, by the way, Bakora never did ever get that milk. I did get the bloody milk. No, you didn't. This is oat milk. It's not real milk. It needs to come from a cow. How do you milk an oat?